My name is Larry Spivak, and I'm president of the Illinois Labor History Society, and I'm honored to be standing here before you today inviting you to support our organization, as so many of you have done. There are so many people to recognize, and before we get to dinner, I have a few things that I want to say, and if you know me, I always have a few things I want to say before somebody uh, pulls me off the stage. We have been doing this dinner since 1981. We have honored uh, anywhere from one to three people each year. If you do the math, it's about 60, 70 people. But there are thousands of people who deserve an honor of, in this Union Hall of Honor, this collective effort, this history-making organization that so many of you belong to. Oh, I can almost hear a pin drop now. We wouldn't be having this dinner tonight in this place if it wasn't for Operating Engineers 399. Let us thank them for their helping us out. Tonight, we come to honor many, dis several distinguished people. Hello, friends. Hi. You will hear more about them. You'll read about them in the book. Why study labor history? You should read this, written by our founder, Les O'Rear, in 1986, the centennial of the Haymarket. I want to thank Governor Thompson, who sent his regrets. He was going to come tonight, but uh, the man who you'll hear a little more about because he played a very important role in the event of, uh, that shapes what we're doing here tonight in some ways. I'll be honoring, I'll be recognizing some more people soon. This dinner is our fundraiser, and we appreciate your support and everything that you do for us. You know, the language of labor has been appropriated by so many, but if you look at labor law and you hear about mutual aid and support, that's what we are about. If you look at uh, what the foundation of the middle class is. It's because of so many that have come before us and why we in the Labor History Society here in Illinois are so excited about always presenting an award to people who have contributed. And it's not just in Illinois, but it's across this country. I suppose that in some ways we're like a large family and like any family there's a certain amount of dysfunction. But that's okay, because that's part of life. That's part of, the, that's part of the human spirit in relation to each other. It's just the way that it is. But we have managed in times of incredible difficulty from the time in this country, from colonialism, the t I guess colonialism, because we were a colony to these day, this day. This year, this program is about the idea of organizing and solidarity, public, private sector. We've honored people from both spheres, both sectors before, but uh, there are a few people that are going to be honored tonight that sort of bring it together. And more than anything, I am grateful to the National AFL-CIO and President Richard Trumka, who out of as busy a schedule as anybody could be anywhere in this country is here tonight with us, and I thank you for that. everybody to remember one of the most important people in this room, even though you don't see him. At age 103 on May 31st this year, he passed away peacefully listening to Renee Fleming sing one of his favorite operas, Les O'Rear, founder of the Illinois Labor History Society. And Lynn, his daughter, is here. Lynn, where are you? Could you uh, here she is. There's Lynn. I have a very exciting announcement for those of you who, who know less. Know the history of this country and the United Packing House Workers of America and the Stockyards, but the city of Chicago, the mayor's office, called a couple weeks ago and, uh, upon our request 
said that they are going to uh, uh, let us dedicate a bench at the Stockyard Gate in honor of Les O'Rear. They own the property. Very exciting. Well, you know, I had the privilege of uh, saying a few words to the Illinois AFL-CIO uh, a month or so ago, and I found the report that I had given. I was dumbfounded by the amount of things the Illinois Labor History Society does every year. You'd think I'd be aware of it, but it's so much, I can't believe it. I could start talking about the help we're doing on the restoration of the Mother Jones Monument, the Miner Cemetery, the work. 402, Pullman may very well become the next national park any day now. <laughs> Site number 402, Pullman. We're waiting for that order by, exe by uh, that executive order from President Obama. Roosevelt University and our collaboration with them where our new home is, is very exciting to professional our professionalize our archives. I'm not gonna go on and on about the many, many tours that we gave, uh, but um, people from around the world continue to come to our friend as the deed holder of the world's most important labor site. And I was so excited a number of years ago when President Trump uh, came with me to a couple of the labor history sites and said he would come here and in that time, we've been able to do the restoration of the monument. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, restore many of the other sites that we're uh, helping out with, and, uh, or that we've got national landmark status for. This is your legacy. This is why we are here, and this is why a uh, dinner like this is so important, to get together for our mutual aid and support and to recognize the contributions of so many. I want to make a couple other uh, recognition of a few other people because it's not just about the past, it's about the present. So for instance, um, there are fights all over this country for low-wage workers. Even though many people who got elected don't support those ideas, the majority of voters around this country have supported the idea of stopping this low wage, this wealth inequality. And so we have a table of workers here, work, warehouse workers for justice over here. We have a more... You've heard about the fight for 15. I mean, my gosh, we think that $9 an hour is actually too much to pay someone? And what about the Chicago taxi drivers who have come here are organizing in the thousands? So, when you take a taxi, make sure, make sure you double that tip. You know, I don't know if Pre President Trump uh, remembers this, but he was only secretary treasurer when his name went on the Hay Haymarket statue at Haymarket Square with President Sweeney at the time. And we've run out of room on the monument for plaques from around the world. And so now the city has said that we're going to work out something to build something, to have plaques so that this tradition on May 1st continues because organized labor has said that they reclaim May 1st because it is our holiday. It's the American holiday. I would be remiss if I didn't thank the Union Labor Insurance Company, Chris DeCaney, the Union Insurance Group, and so many more. I know that I'm not mentioning everyone right now, but have, have, they have helped us so much in getting this dinner together and for you to be able to be here. Um, I'm going to stop now. I was going to talk about uh, French utopian, uh, uh, utopianism and all these really cool philosophical things, but okay, we don't have time for that. What I'd like to do now is bring up a good friend, the director of Arise Chicago, Reverend C.J. Hawking, to help us bless this dinner. Often Christians pray before meals, Jews pray after meals, and labor historians are gonna pray right in the middle of the meal. <laughs> and so I ask you for a moment to please put your fork down. Let us pause together. 
Let us collect our hearts and minds together as we enter into a place of gratitude and vision. Let us go to that place of gratitude for the workers in the field who labored to bring us this food and the vision that they might have water and shade and a safe environment. Let us enter that place where we have gratitude for the truckers and the warehouse workers who brought the food into the city. And let us wrap this in the vision that they might have reasonable schedules and dignity and healthy bodies. Let us enter into the place of gratitude for our servers, our dishwashers, and the laundry attendants, and wrap that in the vision that they may be paid properly, have time with their families, and be honored for their work. Let us wrap our gratitude for all the labor leaders and all the rank and filers of past generations and wrap it in the vision of the future that all people are given a seat at the table and share in the abundance of creation so that we might all know we are one. We are one. May we all be one. Thank you. I've decided that uh, instead of just yakking on, and I'm going to introduce after dinner our first time ever executive director, Stephanie Sewell, and she'll say a few words after dinner. So enjoy. I want to recognize uh, Department of Labor Chairman in Illinois, Joe Costigan. Joe, also a uh, previous life, longtime union representative. I want to recognize Jesus Chuy Garcia, Commissioner. My goodness, what happened to one of the only good congressmen in the entire country? Where Representative, where Congresswoman Chikowski go? Where is she? She was right here a moment ago. Congressman Chikowski. A friend of mine who is, uh, I don't know, what, you know, he probably did this in school years ago, sitting in the back, and he's running for alderman in uh, uh, one of those uh, many wards in Chicago. My friend, who is also loves labor history, and we work together on many things, Jorge Mujica. I think earlier I saw Representative Brennan Phelps. And I saw our former controller Dan Hines. We do have a table of uh, what we call young workers from the uh, AFL-CIO and an independent organization as well. You'll note that we have a booth for Pullman. It's not our big exhibit, it's our small exhibit. And uh, again, National Park 402, soon to be Pullman. Would all Illinois Labor History Society board members who are here tonight, if you remember you're on the board, please stand. We sometimes forget who we are. As always is the case, for the last four years, she is uh, not going to be working uh, for us anymore, but she kind of literally kept the office together. And we owe her a debt of gratitude for her incredible design. Uh, more of her time was volunteer than paid. Uh, that's called wage theft if you actually work for somebody that's not a, uh, uh, an employer. So 
Uh, but Joanna Misnick, oh, uh, she happens to be working at this moment, even though she was a guest. Uh, Joanna Misnick. There are many others who I will be recognizing, uh, uh, as somebody reminds me. But I also uh, want to take uh, make acknowledgement of the many labor organizations and unions and individuals of those organizations who came a fairly long way to be here today. And uh, it's uh, not always uh, easy on a Friday night. It's not easy when you worked every Saturday for the last two months. It's not easy when you work around the clock to provide representation or to organize, to try to keep a middle class alive in this country. And uh, so many of our uh, affiliates and uh, non-affiliated unions of the AFL-CIO that are participating tonight, I want to thank you. Some of uh, you have been sponsors of this. Your name is in the book. And uh, of course, my own union, AFSCME, is always very generous. In a few moments, I am going to ask our musician to come up and sing a song. But before I do that, I want to introduce our first time ever executive director. This is a goal of ours so that we can build this organization way beyond what we've been able to do. And as you look around, look what we've done. And look at what people around the world come every year to honor the labor history sites to know that uh, the words of uh, I know some people used to reject this, but now it is the only way we will ever survive as workers of the world unite. And so whether you're a steel worker or anywhere in the world, uh, you, now you work anywhere if you work for McDonald's, anywhere in the world. Most of the clothes we are wearing, unfortunately, are made by some impoverished person, person somewhere in the world, and yet, the dignity that people go to work every day to survive is something that we honor. And so that's what we do. Uh, Stephanie Sewell comes to us from the University of Illinois and from Cleveland before that in Indianapolis after Cleveland, but she doesn't need a whole biography. She's our executive director. Uh, she's working out of our office at Roosevelt University in collaboration with that great institution that honors the history of labor, the great Joe Jacobs Collection, the Center for Working Class Studies. And even though we are so happy that we're working with them, we have our friends from DePaul University uh, Labor Ed Program. We have our friends from the University of Illinois Labor Ed Program. Stephanie, would you say a few words, please? Stephanie Sewell. Thank you all for coming. I want to give a special thank you to everybody who waited patiently to get a table, waited in line to find out where you were seating. Unless you can't tell, we have more people here than we ever expected. Um, over the course of... <laughs> over the course of the last week, we had 100 more people sign up than we had from last Friday. And so I want to thank you to all of our sponsors who've been flashing on the screen. We couldn't have done this without you. I want to thank President Trump Cup for coming. So many people were so excited to come and hear you talk that I had people calling me today asking for tickets. So I thank you. If I haven't had a chance to talk to you yet, I'm going to. We're going to be working together. We're going to make labor history a hot ticket in the state of Illinois. And And this event is going to kick us off in an exciting and strong direction. So thank you to everybody. And the last person I want to thank especially is Joanna, who I couldn't have done this event without her. And I literally started three weeks ago, and she helped me every step of the way. And also to Larry and to all the board members who've, wel who've welcomed me with such kindness. Thank you. We better read our agenda here and see where we're at.
Again, Michelle Gunderson. Well, everybody, two years ago, there were 30,000 of us in the street with red shirts on. And we were saying, get up, get down. Chicago is a union town. And part of that historic strike, we sang our hearts out. And when we sing union songs, it's participatory music. It's something that we do together. And in honor of Regina Polk, let's sing Union Made together. So here's how the chorus goes. It's good to marry a union woman, too. You guys want to be free. Just take a tip from me. Get you a good union man. And join the ladies auxiliary. A married life ain't the heart. When you own a union car. A union life is a happy life. Chicago teachers. Uh, we're going to begin our program as if it hadn't already begun. I'm thinking about a quote that people actually misattribute. My understanding is it actually goes back, I know this will surprise some of you that I would know this, from the Acts of Apostles, attributed to a French man, and it goes like this. From each according to his ability, to each according to his need. And that is the essence of what we are about. I think it's kind of interesting because so often early Christianity and socialism are actually, they, they recognize each other and ultimately it's about a better life and helping each other. 
And I think about the people here who are so able and are able to give to others. I look around the room and I see Richard Trumka, who has a gift, which is why he is what today. I see my friend Pat Botticelli, who I've known for so many years, who has contributed in so many ways uh, to help his community and his friends. I see Emily Rosenberg from the DePaul Labor Ed Program, who has done so much. I see Steve Ashby, University of Illinois professor, gifted and able. So many uh, local presidents here. President Steve Mittens, Department of Children and Family Services. How, what do you do to want that job? But he has a union that makes it a livable job, but one of the most important in the world. This is the work that people do here, the hospital workers. And then I think about those who are less able to help themselves, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. And that's why the Chicago taxi drivers are organizing. That's why the warehouse workers are organizing. And that's why, as we change the landscape of the nation, despite what you have seen, that we're going to continue to help each other because this is how we create a great nation. And ultimately, we know. The foundation of a democracy is when workers on a job have a voice. That is the basic foundation of democracy. But now, I would like to ask Debbie Pope, Recording Secretary of the Illinois Labor History Society, longtime activist with the Chicago Teachers Union, and many other things, to talk a little bit about one of our honorees tonight, Regina Pope. Brothers and sisters, this is an honor for me. Regina Polk is someone who I first heard about as a young activist in the 80s. She is someone who left a legacy behind her, and that legacy was based on a fabulous life of activism. A young woman from a poor farm family went to Mills College, became involved basically in the excitement and the protests that were going on in Berkeley, got uh, involved in doing some stuff, was working at a motel, found out that, geez, people at the Red Star Inn are not treated very well. Organized her fellow workers, despite people telling her, no, this is really not gonna work out, and was able to do that successfully, got fired in the process. We're all familiar with a little of that that still goes on today. Unfair labor practices filed, and she became a union organizer. And as a union organizer, she did amazing things. Remember, it's still hard for women in the labor movement, and it was even harder 30 and 40 years ago for women in the labor movement. She was a young woman. It's still harder for young people, and young women in particular. People just don't take them as seriously as they should. Regina Polk, through her actions, organizing Teamsters on the West Coast and here in the Chicago area, proved that women and women in the trade union movement are a force to be reckoned with. Regina Polk is someone who we emulate today, the wonderful legacy that she and her family have left to us, the Regina Polk Leadership Conference, where women, and I think there are many of them here, women from Regina Polk, give us a hand. All right. I was very honored to do a workshop at one of the uh, Regina Polk conferences. These are a shining example of what we need so much more of in our labor movement. Bringing new people in, teaching them the ways of the labor movement, elevating them, helping them move up so that we can build the kind of strong and powerful labor movement that will take back this country for the working class and for the 99%. So, I am honored beyond belief to be here speaking about Regina Polk. We are going to invite her husband, Tom Hagee, up 
and Larry has a word or two that he wants to say. No. Tom, yes, please come up. Let me just say a couple things about Tom. You know, the Regina Polk Foundation is an awesome organization, and so many of them here today, and so many alumni and people who've been through the program and having had the opportunity to give some labor history tours. And uh, anybody that could be as close to Regina uh, that could be here is, and it's her husband, Tom Hagee, uh, who spent many years here in Chicago. He was uh, vice chairman and chief financial officer at LaSalle Bank Corporation, uh, member of the board of directors of LaSalle Bank. He's worked with South Shore Bank, um, but he also has an interesting background because he has a, a, mas a bachelor's degree in physics and a master's degree in finance from the University of Chicago. So a very interesting background to say the least. And once again, that is the nature of all of us, isn't it? That we have these diverse, incredible backgrounds. And I thank Tom Hagee for coming today from Sea Island, Georgia to be with us and for us to present this award to Dr. Okay, it is with great pleasure, brothers and sisters, that I present this award to Tom Hagee on behalf of the wonderful work of Regina Polk and of the Regina Polk Leadership Conference. And Tom, I want to say it is a pleasure to meet a banker with values like yours. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to talk about banking. Um, when Gina was alive, the union, move, the union movement was under attack. And they're still under attack today. They're blamed for loss of manufacturing jobs, fiscal problems in municipalities, educational problems in the schools, and many, many more things. Membership is declining. So what can we do? We can educate the public and we can strengthen our unions. Those are both things that Gina did during her short career. Since she died, the Regina Polk Scholarship Fund has been created to commemorate her memory and to carry on her values. We educate the public through a high school training program that touches 200 students a year from the Paul run by DePaul University. And we strengthen unions by having a conference uh, every year for 40 women run by the University of Illinois, and several of the women are here tonight. These, <laughs> these programs continue Gina's work and her legacy, and on behalf of uh, myself personally and the foundation, I'm very honored to accept this award. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you, Regina, for being there to help uh, create something that other people now can enjoy, a better life. Judy Simpson, are you here? Judy came all the way up, or came all the way. I know how it is in Illinois. We always talk about downstate, upstate. No, you know, Springfield's still upstate. If you're way downstate, you know the whole thing, especially when you travel the state. Came Judy from Simpson. South of Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, South of Kentucky. Judy Simpson is going to uh, um, say a few words about our next inductee. Connell Smith and the legacy of the Smith family, but Connell in particular, that has helped build a labor movement that has created better lives for families, especially in Southern Illinois. Judy Simpson is on the board also of the Illinois Labor History Society. As Larry said, Illinois is a very long state. And if you go to the absolute tip of it, which is basically about 100 miles south of where I come from, <laughs> you go to a little place called Cairo. Cairo has been a blighted city for many, many generations. 
And there a man named Kamal Smith came and started organizing workers. A carpenter in my former life as, as an archivist came into my office once and sat down because they knew I liked a good story. And he had leaned back and he told me, as the story goes, Connell Smith went down to the, to the shore there in Cairo and was organizing workers. And he told them, listen, let me work for you. Let me help you negotiate your salaries, your wages for a month or two. And if you like it, we'll continue. If not, that's fine and I won't take a dime. Well, Local 773 of the Hod Carriers and Common Laborers, now known as the Laborers International Union of North America, Local 773 now boasts well over 4,000 and will soon hit 5,000. It is one of the largest locals in our international and covers a wide variety of people. As an organizer for the group and a field representative, I have health care workers, I have bus drivers, I have professors, I have any person imaginable. And it's because of Connell Smith. I would not be afforded the opportunity in Southern Illinois, realistically, to have a union, a union salary if it were not for the work of this man. When we got the archives there at Southern Illinois University and I was going through the papers of Connell Smith, I would come across letter after letter where he worked trying to find work for everyone, not only his members, but disenfranchised people, African American women. He was trying hard, and this was in the 1940s, to find work. They were, women weren't even in that union at that time. But when it came into the 70s and we started with public and private employees, a place for me, things really boomed. And I am forever indebted to a man named Connell Smith. And with all those great things he did, he was guided daily by one, one philosophy, one question. Who can I help today? When I interviewed his wife who passed earlier this year, Mary Jewel Smith, a wonderful woman, she told me of an evening once where Connell was just restless and she, he, was, he was touchy and grouchy and she said, well, Connell, what's wrong? He said, well, Mom, Mom, I don't think I helped anyone today. And he, he was just hard to live with. She said, come on, we're gonna help someone. They got the kids up, put them in the car, went out, found a man hitchhiking, gave him a ride to the next state, tried to help him find a job. He could sleep that night. And I think, what a better world would it be for each of us if we would wake up every morning and say, who can I help today? Because that's the labor movement. And accepting will be Ed Smith, who has a unique connection to two of our members, to, or two of our inductees tonight. Not only is he the son of Connell Smith, but when Regina, Regina was lost in that plane crash, she was traveling to a meeting with Ed that evening. Ed Smith, everyone. Laborers have been a great friend of the Labor History Society, and Ed is president and CEO of the Union Labor Insurance Company and uh, was representative for the laborers in Southern Illinois at that great local uh, that his father started. And uh, again, Ed, thank you and uh, for coming all the way here. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Judy. Uh, what an honor to uh, talk about my dad. And uh, before I do that, I want to just thank uh, Judy Simpson. Judy, uh, the laborers 773 represented uh, the ground maintenance employees at Southern Illinois University. And because they're union members, they had a great contract. And the librarians, where Judy was, says, how do we get a contract like those ground maintenance laborers? So Judy organized 
the librarians at Southern Illinois University there in the M773 because, because, because of Judy. And we gave uh, our papers and archives to Southern Illinois University. Well, Judy's reading all those papers about my dad. And uh, so, so she's the one that, that submitted this. I'm so proud of that you did this. It's a great honor. And uh, before I do, I want to talk a little bit about him, but I just want to mention a couple other things. I did, I saw Ron Peters here from the University of Illinois, and Ron used to run the labor uh, uh, classes and schools at U of I. And I had the pleasure of meeting Regina Pope, because we sat together in one of those classes many, many years ago when she was down at U of I. And we were a big organizing of public employees in those, in those years. I want to mention, too, Bob Gibson, who's our other honoree. Now, if years of late, Bob Gibson and I go to a St. Louis Cardinal game with Alan Dixon. And uh, we lost uh, Senator Dixon recently. The other time I'd see Bob was at uh, Gulfstream Racetrack, uh, Rich. So, uh, so I know that he's enjoying retirement. But, but just a couple words about, about Bob Gibson, and, and, I'll, and Rich, you'll fit right into this too. I was lobbying the Illinois legislature uh, as a young rep for the Labor's Union when Bob Gibson was head of our AFL-CIO. I know he's going to talk about it tonight. When we in this state had right to work come out of the House Labor Committee, uh, when we had our back against it back in the early 80s. And if you remember, in the 80s, and we're under siege today, damn right we're under siege today. We were under siege then, with the air traffic controllers all being fired, and Reagan sending a message, this is how you deal with workers, this is what you do. Every time Reagan took us on in Illinois, Bob Gibson passed legislation through Governor Thompson to stop right to work, to stop attacks on prevailing wage. That's what Bob Gibson did. One of our greatest leaders, and I know he's going to be honored tonight. I always say two heroes. I was so lucky to be in Illinois in the 80s because we had Bob Gibson and we were able to, to fight back what the Reagan administration was trying to do. We lost so many battles in the 80s, and the, and the one hero we had nationally was a guy named Rich Trumpkin, who led the Pittston strike, the strike that we won so that all of us won. Rich Trumpkin knows where Southern Illinois is, because when he was campaigning at the age of 32 years old, be president of the United Mine Workers. He was down in Ducoin and, and West Frankfurt and Benton and all our towns in Southern Illinois. Uh, so you've got a great lineup tonight. Let, let me just introduce uh, my wife, Betty, who's a 38-year member of Labor's Local 773. Uh, and the current president of Local 773, my son, Matt. Stand up, Matt. Uh, now, Matt, Matt has a son. Matt has a son named Trevor, uh, who will be five years old this January, January 17th. When he was born January 17, 2010, I said, Matt, we have to take Trevor to the February union meeting and introduce him to the membership, which he did. He brought his little boy, Trevor, to the February union meeting in, in 2010 and held Trevor, little Trevor, about 10, 12 pounds, as you can see his grandpa and his dad, and we introduced Trevor. We said, Trevor, your great-grandpa, who we're honoring tonight, your grandpa, your father, and now you are the next generation of Labor's Local 773. <laughs> and if you ask Trevor today, and Trevor's a big kid, and, I, and, his, and we were talking earlier, I didn't know any nursery rhymes. So what I taught Trevor is, you can't scare me, I'm sticking with the union. And that's what Trevor will tell you. If he walked up here right now, I'd say, Trevor, he'd say, you can't scare me, I'm sticking with the union. And that's what that little boy said. One little bit about my dad, and then I'll, I'll, you know, got a great program. We're gonna hear from Bob Gibson, we're gonna hear from Rich Trumpkin. My dad was born 100 years ago, February 14, 1914. 
He, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch wrote an article about my father, not very flattering article back in the 50s, and said he was born in a river shanty outside the protective levee walls of Cairo, Illinois. He rose up to be a union organizer. He worked for 10 cents an hour in a, in a cottonseed oil mill. He got an extra nickel if he didn't take his lunch. He knew a better way. He was able to get on WPA. He drove a car for FDR's first election in 1932 when he was only 18, not old enough to vote. He had to be 21 in those days, but he was active politically. He started farming unions, and that's what he did. And he, he organized for the my union, the laborers, the architect, technical engineers union, the Teamsters union. He was an organizer involved in, in numerous strikes. Southern Illinois, I always say, is a rural area, but it has the strongest union history, primarily because of Rich's United Mine Workers. But all the other unions are in Southern Illinois, too. Guys like my father, who would be so flattered to be honored tonight, and he'd say, what's the big fuss? All I was doing was doing my job. But Southern Illinois is a great union culture to this day. When you go down there, the construction work is union. We still have the union facilities. Certainly, the universities are uh, entirely organized, the most organized university in the nation. Uh, we have a great culture in Southern Illinois. My dad, along with a lot of others, was part of that. He left just like so many others did and went to World War II, 43, 44. His, his, after he had got our local charter, was head of our local, he and four brothers, he came back. His best friend was, uh, was in charge of the local. My dad said, I'm back. He said, well, that's too late. To, you know, you're not getting it. My dad ran against him, his best friend. The only time my father ever had opposition for any office and beat him and, and, and took the local back, 1945. He, he, he was there until 1976 when he retired um, from an organizer in the 30s. I'll leave you with his, uh, his poem. Here's what, uh, and Judy said, is, if you go into our local union hall, it says, who can I help today? It, our union hall is dedicated uh, to my dad, Connell Smith. Uh, my mother, who passed away earlier this year, worked at our local union office until she was 87 years old. My dad died in 1988, and she kept coming to the Union Hall until she was 87. We lost her this year. They met, they met during World War II. She was a machinist working in a defense plant. My dad was already head of the Labor's Union. He had a poem uh, that he believed in and went like this, and I'll leave you with this. I saw a group of men in my hometown. I saw them tear a building down. With a heave and a hoe and a mighty yell, they swung a beam and the building fell. I went to the foreman and I said, are these men skilled? He laughed and said, no indeed, common labor is all I need. For I can tear down in a day or two what it took a builder 10 years to do. I thought to myself as I walked away, which of these roles am I going to play? Am I the type that constantly tears down as I make my way foolishly around? Or am I the type that builds with care in hopes that my country, my family, and my union will be glad that I was there? Thank you very much. Actors, uh, come up to the stage, please. The actors. We're going to have a uh, dramatic reading. I hope it's dramatic. These are professionals. Before we honor our next inductee. By the way, I see steel workers, I see laborers from around the state, I see retired steel workers who are here, I see uh, uh, Illinois Federation of Teachers and the Illinois Education Association here. 
a number of the building trades. There are many in Chicago because they're all organized. I see the uh, Sadlowski family. Ed Sr., he's with us in spirit, a former honoree, and uh, coming in from Rockford and Janesville. And uh, oh, I see my friend Paul Derica, who has staged so many of the reenactments, and Paul. Uh, will remind us that this coming year, 2015, is the 100th anniversary. Uh, we love massacres and deaths, so the death of Joe Hill, which is really don't mourn, organize, and all of that. And uh, uh, Paul is working on programs uh, we will be co-sponsoring to uh, commemorate the 100th anniversary of the execution of the man who never died. Now, this whole program that we talk about in terms of organizing private and public together. There's a history that's really interesting and is the spirit of America in many ways. It's a bipartisan spirit. It's a, it's a d democratic idea of having public sector unionism in a time when it wasn't considered to be correct in some places. Um, but before we honor the man that helped usher it in, uh, we have uh, three actors here who are going to uh, do a presentation written by one of our own board members, Mike Matika. So, if you will. Thank you. A right to organize. A very basic union right. You cannot have an effective union if you do not have a right to organize. Organize the unorganized was the 1930s battle cry. The CIO, Congress of Industrial Organizations, launched a great wave of union organizing with the American Federation of Labor close behind. The National Labor Relations Act of 1935 gave workers the right to organize. Except. Except. Except, except what? what? Except the National Labor Relations Act of 1935 was for the private sector workforce only. Two groups of people were exempted from the law, farm workers and public employees. Okay, but why would workers be excluded from our greatest labor law? Because government allowed workers to organize, but not their own government workers. And Southern senators didn't want sharecroppers to vote, so farm workers were excluded. So do public employees get a union? Federal workers were allowed some union rights under President John F. Kennedy in 1962, but public employees are dependent upon each state making its own laws, and farm workers have the right to organize in only one state, California. Well, in Illinois workers have great public employee laws, card check, elections, bargaining rights. We in Illinois can stand proud. <laughs> Not always. Illinois was the last major industrial, heavily unionized state to grant public employees rights. Surely the Illinois legislator could have easily granted those rights? It was almost a 20-year effort, argued and debated by Illinois labor before public employees had bargaining rights. And to finally make it happen, it took some strange bedfellows. Hmm. A Republican, a Democratic labor leader, an African-American big city mayor to help Illinois public employees win their rights. Way back in 1952, a bill to give Illinois public employees collective bargaining was introduced in the Illinois legislature. Defeated. The bill was introduced again in 1953. Defeated. Ten years later, 1963, State Representative Ruben Soderstrom introduced a public employee bargaining bill. Passed Pass the, the Illinois, Illinois House, House, defeated, defeated in, in the Senate. Senate. If you cannot win the right to bargain in the State House, you can win a contract in your own town. Strike, strike, strike! strike. 1970, an illegal nationwide postal worker strike helped win contracts for postal workers. 1969, 1971, 1973, Chicago teachers strike. 1968, Rockford firefighters strike, followed by firefighters strike in the 1970s in Springfield, Danville, Joliet, Normal, Aurora, and finally Chicago. Teachers arrested, going to jail for trying to get a union contract. 
while in Normal, Illinois in 1978, they threw the whole fire department in jail for trying to win a union contract. There ought to be a law. There ought to be a law. There ought to be a law. Even within labor, there were fierce debates about public employee unions. Public employees introduced Illinois AFL-CIO convention resolutions supporting organizing, but with a no-strike clause. Wait, what do you mean a no-strike clause? If we support a no-strike clause in Illinois, the Illinois legislature might pass a law that said my members in the factory can't strike. I'll support rights for public employees bargaining, but I'm not going to sacrifice my put my stri right to strike. No, you can still strike, but with a no-strike clause, we can't pass a public employee bargaining bill. You're not going to take away my right to strike. We public employees need collective bargaining rights and are willing to swallow a no-strike clause to get it. But if you do that, then they may take away our right to strike in factories and on construction sites. Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. I'll support public employee bargaining, but I won't support a no-strike resolution. Okay, well, if you came to an Illinois AFL-CIO convention in the 1970s, there was heated debate every year over public employee bargaining. And some people saw the long arm of Chicago politics. His honor, the mayor, had city workers loyal to him and his machine. If they had a union, they might not be so loyal to the mayor. So, chaos reigned in Illinois. Public employees struck and often went to jail. Schools and city services were often shut down. Public employees having union rights was a huge Illinois issue in the 1970s. Odd things were happening in Springfield. Public employee bills came up for a vote, but never passed both houses. It was not a Democratic-Republican divide at critical moments. Some Democratic politicians voted no or simply did not appear. Like I said, some people saw the long arm of city politics. Resolved in 1978, the Illinois AFL-CIO convention made public employee collective bargaining its number one goal. There was lots of grumbling, lots of debate. But Illinois AFL-CIO President Robert Gibson now had a clear mandate. Illinois Labor, let's pass collective bargaining. But then, 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected. <laughs> the Illinois Republican Party won control of Illinois. The State House, the State Senate, the Governorship. Have you seen these new bills in the Illinois Legislature? Right to work. Cut unemployment insurance, repeal prevailing wage, gut workers' compensation, fire any employ public employee who strikes. What will we do? Well, Illinois AFL-CIO President Robert Gibson knew what to do. Mobilize the troop, march on Springfield, knock on every legislator's door, make labor's voice Heard. The largest ever. The largest ever. The largest ever rally at the Illinois State Capitol, June 2nd, 1981. Special trains roll from Chicago, buses from across the state. 20,000 angry union workers converge on the Illinois State Capitol law. Don't take our rights away. Bob Gibson showed what labor can do united. But who stole the show that day? Eh, you won't believe it. It was a Republican. Governor James Thompson addressed the group, pumped up labor, and promised he would block those anti-union bills. Labor relaxed with a beer after that rally. <laughs> but they weren't at a Springfield bar. Mm -mm. They were on the governor's lawn, having a free, cool one, courtesy of the Republican governor. Strange bedfellows, labor and a Republican governor, Bob Gibson and Republican governor James Thompson began working together. In 1982, the Democrats came back to power in the State House, but public employee legislation still stalled in the State House. 
So could Democrat Bob Gibson and Republican Jim Thompson break the legislative log jam? It took a trio to open it up. Chicago did something Chicago had never done before. Chicago made history in, on April 12, 1983, electing a new city council and a new mayor, a mayor with a different perspective. Things were definitely going to be different in the city of big shoulders. That spring, as public employee legislation again crawled its way through the Illinois State House, a telephone call came from the new Chicago mayor's office. Don't oppose public employee bargaining bills. With Bob Gibson by his side on September 23rd, 1983, Republican Governor James Thompson signed the Illinois Public Employee Collective Bargaining Bill. But it would take two more years for firefighters and police to win their rights. But the dam had broken. Illinois public employees were now full citizens in the House of Labor. 1983, Illinois was the last industrial state to establish public employee collective bargaining. And look what happened since then. Union membership grew quickly in the public sector and become another strong foundation for Illinois labor. Back in the 1970s and 1980s, it took some strange bedfellows, some strong leaders working together. An innovative and progressive Illinois AFL-CIO president, Robert G. Gibson, and his gifted lobbyist, Richard Walsh. A progressive Republican, Governor James Thompson. And Chicago's first African-American mayor, Democrat Harold Washington. <laughs> Together, they made history for Illinois' labor. Together, they helped open doors for Illinois workers. Together, 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 we stand together, together, together and, and advance workers' rights everywhere. Together. You just heard. From our Screen Actors Guild, our Chicago Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television Recording Artists, Alyssa Freyden, Ashley Dearborn, and Cruz Gonzalez. Thank you. Well, in 1983, I was teaching at the Illinois State Psychiatric Institute and vice president of my local union. And the law was passed, and I said, what do I want to be, a union organizer? And AFSCME National Union hired me. I guess I interview well or something. And uh, became an organizer and got to work on elections uh, 1984 for the city and for the county. And then shortly after that, a young man who was here was going to come up to introduce uh, our inductee, Steve Cullen, who became a good friend and my boss. Steve Cullen was director of AFSCME Council 31, and we grew from 20,000 to 75,000 in just a few years under Steve's leadership. And Steve Cullen knows very well this period because of being one of the most interested organizations in public sector bargaining rights that we had prior to that. Steve Cullen drove around the state of Illinois organizing as well. My friend, now retired and living the better life, Steve Cullen. That was a wonderful presentation, by the way. Thank you, Larry. It's really nice to be here. In fact, at my age, it's nice to be anywhere. So, uh, my, uh, my role today is doubly an honor. First of all, I've been asked to fill in for Governor Thompson, who proved to be a true friend of Illinois labor and the signer of what we call, what we might call the Magna Carta of public employees in, in Illinois. Secondly, what a great honor to be able to introduce Bob Gibson, my friend and a great union leader. 
Let me say a few words about both Bob and the governor. I remember meeting Governor Thompson and Bob in the early 80s. I, I remember a meeting with Bob, uh, Governor Thompson and Bob in the early 80s. We had a discussion about the wisdom of passing a public employee collective bargaining law. Bob made an earnest appeal saying the time has come to give public employees the same rights as their counterparts in the private sector. The governor said, if you, put that, if you put the bill on my desk, I'll sign it. The collective bargaining bill was really the holy grail for AFSCME, the teachers unions, and a few others who represented public employees. I must also say that not all of our union friends were particularly enthusiastic about the issue. They needed the strong support of the state AFL-CIO and key, po key politicians. It was then that we turned to Bob Gibson, who rolled up his sleeves and used his powers of persuasion and his reputation in the legislature to lobby for the bill. To make a long story short, in 1983, Public Employee Collective Bargaining passed in Illinois. Governor James Thompson, a Republican, did what Democratic governors refused to do. He signed the bill into law. Because of the respect he had for Bob, he signed it at the state fed office. Samuel Gomper said, we must support our friends and destroy our enemies. I remember meeting with the governor's opponent who told me that he was going to win. And when he did, public employees were going to have to make some sacrifices in their paychecks. James Thompson proved to be our friend and earned the endorsement of AFSCME and several other unions. Just think, in less than two months, we will be faced with a governor who has vowed to take public employees on, force a strike, and in his way to make Illinois a right to work for less state. Now, as an aside, uh, Governor Thompson would go down to the uh, uh, AFL-CIO winter meetings and uh, uh, with the AFL-CIO. While there, he would uh, hobnob with the, uh, with the uh, labor leaders, and then he would take, uh, take a, uh, about seven or eight, ten of us to dinner. Around 1990, we were at dinner with, uh, with Bob, the governor, and I, Bob, the governor, and I were overserved. Uh, with the governor in the middle, Bob and I on either side, we tried to talk him into becoming a Democrat. Uh, seemed like a good idea at the time, and then we sobered up the next day. So, I first met Bob shortly after I became the executive director of AFSCME Illinois in 1980. Up until that time, we had very low participation in the state fed. Bob said he wanted our union to be, more active, be a more active participant in Illinois labor. He nominated me as a board member on the state fed. The 80s were a good time for public employee organizing, and I'm convinced that much of that success was due to Bob's influence. So in appreciation, appreciation I'm glad to be here tonight to be part of the tribute to a great labor leader who has contributed so much to the history of Illinois labor. Bob believed that the labor movement's involvement doesn't stop at the door of the Union Hall. It has held numerous civic, governmental, and political posts, almost too numerous to mention, but I'll mention just a few. He was the vice chairman of the Madison County Democratic Organization state president of the Young Democrats of Illinois, delegate or alternate to four national democratic conventions. He was kicked out of the last one he attended. Uh, I think that was 1960, right, Bob? Yeah. Uh, he was one of the 10 people selected by President Kennedy to represent the U.S. at the Young Leaders Conference in Germany in 1963. He was selected by the U.S. State Department as one of four young Americans to attend NATO strategy sessions in Italy in 1966. He was a member of the Illinois trade mission to the Far East, visiting labor leaders in Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, the Philippines, and Australia. 
He was a delegate to the White House Conference on Children and Youth. He presently serves as Illinois President of the USO, USO uh, board member of the Mid-American Chapter of the Red Cross, and finally, but certainly not the entire list, he is on the Board of Goodwill Industries. And now, uh, we have, yes, yeah. Bob, Bob, would you step up? Thank you very much, Steve, for those kind words. I've known Steve Cullum for about 40 years. Uh, asked me wasn't a, wasn't a significant part of the state AFL-CIO at that time uh, because they had an international president that was a little uh, eccentric. <laughs> yes. We'll call him that. <laughs> Uh, and we had a different director here about every two months. Uh, they would they'd fire him or change him or whatever, but uh, and then Steve Cullen came along and he took charge. And he done, you've heard the, the numbers uh, of what he done. He's a great fan. Larry Spivak, uh, President Trumpka. Uh, members of the Illinois Historical Society. This is not my first meeting at your, at your group. Uh, I was in a little better health at those meetings, too, and, and a lot younger. Uh, but uh, having just celebrated my 87th birthday, Colin's glad to be here. I'm gladder. <laughs> uh, I can I can tell you the fight we had with with uh, with Governor Thompson has been been uh, already identified, uh, but we stopped right to work in Illinois. We had the biggest Labor Day parade down Michigan Avenue with Harold Washington. As our, as our leader here in Chicago. Uh, we had the largest, largest, uh, uh, we stopped work, right to work after it had come from committee. We stopped right to work in its tracks, and it hasn't surfaced since here in Illinois to be, a, to be an issue. And, and that was a, an important issue in those days. I get disappointed sometime in our Democratic friends in, in Washington, uh, who we've had Democratic friends uh, both in both houses and the White House, and never been able to beat 14B. Uh, I never quite understood how that, how that worked, but it works with the lobbyists, uh, the people there who, who donate to both sides, I think. And now, after the United Citizens' uh, decision, uh, I'm not sure we can even uh, keep up uh, in that regard. Uh, we just have to outnumber them and make sure we vote. That's the important thing. Where was I? <laughs> I, want, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, this was a high honor for me. I wouldn't have missed it. I just talked to my friend and, and my, my neighbor in Florida. It's 80 degrees there. I just thought you all 
Just thought you know the sacrifice I've made to be here. <laughs> So, we're, 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 <laughs> okay, um, thank you all for coming, and thank you very much for the suggestion that I might be in an honor, along with the people. Gibson, everybody, we owe a debt of gratitude for his leadership. Okay, you know, because Trump goes towards the end of the alphabet, he got that card like S, Spivak, except uh, always a little bit later in the program. His patience is uh, always tried, but uh, he's got to go through all kinds of speeches, so um, he's going to be introduced shortly in a moment. Oh, United Auto Workers, hello, good to see you here. Our Union Hall of Honor, let's say uh, one, of, one of you will be inducted too. Hey, Mark Rogovin, uh, last year's honoree, a man who keeps our history of Haymarket going. So, another friend of mine who I've gotten to know recently, he just disappeared. Oh, there he is. He's uh, uh, Robert C. Ryder, Bob Ryder, Secretary Treasurer of the Chicago Federation of Labor. Uh, I'm politically supposed to say, you know, every single one is always great, but I could tell you that Bob is great because of many reasons which include the fact that labor history is central to what he guides him. I know this, he's on our board, not as a, Bob comes to meetings. And so Bob has done so much to help us out and he's here tonight to introduce our esteemed Keynote speaker, Bob Ryder. Thanks, Larry. As Larry said, my name is Bob Ryder. I'm Secretary Treasurer of the Chicago Federation of Labor. The CFL represents over 300 local unions and over half a million working men and women right here in the hometown of the American Labor Movement, Chicago, Illinois. It's great to be here with so many friends and to be able to introduce a great friend of mine. Be here for Bob Gibson, Regina Polk, and the father of a good friend of mine and Jorge's, my, the guy I work with every day, President Jorge Ramirez, Ed Smith. Ed has been so good, and this is, you know, and I'm an operating engineer, right? We talk about this a lot, Ed. An operating engineer and a laborer walking hand in hand, nobody can beat us, right? <laughs> yeah, anything's possible. Um, you know, like I said, the CFL represents all the working men and women here in Chicago. And, you know, if you look in your program, there's one ad I was flipping through. Um, this week, one of our executive board members, I want to tell you a little bit about him. He was, over three and a half years ago, he was a vice president of his local union. Um, a local union that, you know, was facing a lot of challenges. And he was able to come into office as business manager. And I don't know that I've seen somebody as fearless, as strong as Terry Allen, the business manager of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 134. You know, Terry, IBW Local 134 has a long history in this city. It's, it's, First created in 1890 when a group of workers formed the union called the uh, Electrical Mechanics Union. And in, eight, in 1900, they were able to get their first international charter. And with the union with so much history and so much strength, Terry epitomized the strength of that local. See, what some of you may or may not know is as strong of a leader as Terry was in his personal life, Almost the entire time he was, if not the entire time, he was business manager, he was battling cancer. And for someone who 
represented his members both in politics, collective bargaining, and organizing, you wouldn't know that this guy was sick by the shake of his hand because he grabbed your hand, he'd rip your arm off. Every day of this man's life, it's what drove him. I remember one of my first meetings with Terry when he became business manager. He sat Jorge and I down and he said, you know what, I want to get this out there. We just organized all these appliance technicians for Sears. And this is a guy who's business manager, one of the biggest construction locals in Chicago. And he took more pride in these subsectors than he did anything else, which was great. Well, this week, Terry lost his battle with cancer. And Jorge and I were talking about this earlier. It's not that Terry showed us how to live. He showed us how to die because he died a strong leader who would do anything for his members, do anything for his union, and always remembered that the reason why he was there was not to do politics for the sake of politics. It wasn't to hold an office for the sake of holding an office. It was to fight for the members of his local. And I just hope that my time with Terry continues to inspire me as the type of leader that I want to be. So I'd just like to take one moment and do a moment of silence for the for business manager, financial secretary of IBEW Local 134, Terry Allen. Thank you. And, it, and as I know Terry would say to me, he's like, get on with it, bro. So I'd just like to acknowledge a couple more people that are here that are good friends of the labor movement. Um, Director of the Illinois Finance Authority and Larry Spivak's neighbor, Chris Meister. I'd also like to acknowledge um, labor leader and director of the Illinois Department of Labor, Joe Costigan. <laughs> and secretary treasurer of the Chicago Building Trades, Ralph Affronti. Ralph. You know, I met our keynote speaker just over four years ago. Jorge said, Bob, we've got our executive board meeting. Rich Trump is coming in to swear us in. I need you to go pick him up. And I, <laughs> and this is a guy that's on national TV. My dad's like, hey, Rich Trump? I see him on Rachel, Rachel Maddow all the time. <laughs> and uh, I go to pick Rich Trump up at the hotel to bring him over to our executive board meeting. And I'm like I am tonight with one difference that I'll mention in a second. Um, I go there, and I'm in a suit, and I'm in a tie, and man, Rich got one look at me, and he said, you know, you may want to loosen that tie a little bit, kid. <laughs> Doesn't look like you can breathe. <laughs> well, Rich, I just want you to know I loosened the tie. I put the dress shoes in the closet. And most days, you guys find me in my cowboy boots because I get a, I get a better, better fighting position with them on. And so, you know, we can... You guys have seen Rich's bio in the program, and you've heard Ed Smith talk about all the fights that Rich has had across the country, including the coal mines in Southern Illinois. And if you know anything about Rich Trumka, you know about his history as a reformer in the mine workers. But I want to talk to you a little bit about the Rich Trumka I know as an officer of a central labor council that's part of the AFL-CIO. Rich Trumka fights every day for a more diverse labor movement that includes young workers, that includes workers that are fighting for immigration reform, for workers of all walks of life who may not have the ability under the National Labor Relations Act, like public sector workers in Illinois, had that same fight before they got their bargaining law. He doesn't care if a worker belongs to a union or can be covered by a union by virtue of a federal statute. 
but is a worker in reality and would be in a union if he could be, wants to be, and should be. Rich fights for workers. He takes them as they come, and he has the battle in their name every day. And we appreciate that, and we are proud of that here at the CFL, that we are able to call Rich our friend and have him as our leader. You know, three things that I've learned from Rich, and he's another person that I have as an inspiration in my life as a, as a labor leader. And I wrote him down, Rich, so I wouldn't forget him. What I've learned from you is know the issues, be smart, and raise some hell. Because that's what a leader is. A leader is not afraid <laughs> to stand up, challenge authority, and fight for what's right. So I'd like to bring up here a very good friend of the Chicago Federation of Labor. He's a member of the United Mine Workers Local 6290, District 4, President of the AFL-CIO, Richard L. Trumka. Thank you. Thank you. Yo, Bob, I wanna thank you for those overly generous words, but uh, more importantly for what you do for workers every day and for your friendship. Uh, you're a great leader uh, and a great friend, and uh, let's hear it uh, for Bob Ryder. He's a great man. I just want to very briefly thank uh, Operating Engineers Local 399 for the hospitality tonight. You're wonderful, and we appreciate everything you did. I want to thank the young workers for your critical imagination, all the help you give us to be a better labor movement. Thank you. I want to ask all of you to look on your table. You'll see a list of sponsors. Uh, these sponsors are with us every day. These are real friends. They're not people that come along once in a while. So if you can do business with them, I would urge you to do that because that's what friends do. Your friends, you treat your friends right, and these are our friends. So take a look at it and let me say thanks. Jan, for what you do every day for us and for the fight that you put on, uh, this is a, a congressperson that you don't have to look lobby when it comes to workers' issues. She's in front of the pack, not behind, behind the pack. Thank you for what you do. To the board members of the Illinois uh, Labor His uh, History Society, I want to thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to be here, and doubly so because of those uh, who we are here to honor tonight, uh, about Connell Smith uh, and Regina Polk, uh, and God bless their memories. And Eddie, congratulations, buddy. Uh, I know what it is. Whenever you have a dad that you can be proud of, congratulations. Appreciate you, pal. And Bob, I just want to thank you for all you've done, for all the people you've helped. And there are literally millions of workers living better because of your efforts. God bless you, buddy. So I want to thank you, and thank you for inviting me to speak to you tonight. This is a a good time to talk about labor and history. Because listen, never in my lifetime have American workers needed the benefits of collective action more than they do today. Never. And I'm not talking about some workers. I'm not even talking about most workers. I'm talking about every single worker in America who counts on a paycheck to pay their bills. Now, 
If you're so rich in America that your paycheck is uh, just the icing on the cake, but you could survive fine without it, then this economy's been treating you just fine and dandy. But if you're anything like the rest of us, these are hard times. Every night across this country, the vast majority of working people sit down to a big plate of worry. On that plate are car payments and house payments, college tuition and student loans, and the holiday season, and the cost of utilities and groceries. And that's just the predictable stuff. Five years into the economic re recovery after the Great Recession, wages for most of us are still falling. The last time wages fell this much was during the Great Depression in the 30s. But America's entire economy was crumbling back then. Today, GDP has been rising since 2009. Profits, corporate profits are at record levels. Productivity has been going through the roof. But the overwhelming majority of us, see, we haven't gained any benefit at all from all of that. This is a time that has no parallel in history. Earlier this fall, federal wage numbers gave us some sobering, and I mean sobering news, because they tell us that there's a skills gap in this country. <coughs> If there was a skills gap in this country, then wages for those skills should be rising. First six months of this year, wages earned by workers with advanced degrees fell by 3%, more than any other segment of the American workforce. And for generations, some white collar workers in America grew accustomed to the idea that, well, the ups and the downs of the blue collar working class was not something that they really had to worry about. Well, the economic conditions of today have sure demonstrated the error of that idea. Every single worker who depends on a paycheck to pay the bills shares the same basic challenges. We work harder and harder. We produce more and more for less and less. And it's exhausting. And it saps you of all your strength. And it saps you of all your hope all your dreams and aspirations, because all you want to do is get past today. See, at the AFL-CIO, we polled people who voted in last Tuesday's election. And here's what we found. 54% of the voters in last Tuesday's election reported that their family income fell this year. And 33% said their income remained flat. Now let me put that together for you. 87% of Americans who cast ballots last Tuesday are heading into this holiday season with the same pay or worse pay than they did last year. And well, prices aren't the same now, are they? Prices climb, but the fortunes of our families are falling. And that fact translates into an enormous amount of pain, an enormous amount of anxiety in America. And I got to tell you, it's not right. In the richest nation on the face of the earth, at its most rich point in time, 
Ninety-some percent of America's workers have a flat income or a falling income, while that little sliver at the top walks away with more and more and more of what we produce. You see, brothers and sisters, I've been thinking about those midterm elections, and quite frankly, I have a few things to say. Here's the first message. For the members of the Republican Party, six short years ago, the American public sent you a loud and a clear message that we don't want economic stability and price collapses of a boom and a bust economy. This year, you've won another chance to put your ideas into action. And unless you want voters to send you packing in two short years, this better not be another bait and switch. You'd better offer something better than deregulation and greater income inequality and fewer jobs. And yes, by that I mean no more tax cuts for those who don't need it the least and that, so that they pay for it by cutting public services that we do need. And I have a message for Democrats, too. The American people gave you a message this year, too. If you don't address the job crisis and falling wages, then to them, you don't matter much. No more compromises. No more compromises when it comes to believing in and investing in the future of America. You see, for too long, too many politicians in the Democratic Party have tried to have it both ways, to be the party of the people and to be the party of Wall Street, but they're neither. Wall Street doesn't want Republican light. that always prefer to drink the real thing and working people don't want it either. And here's my second message for Republicans. See, if any Republican wants to step forward as a leader of the priorities of working people, well, let me tell you, we're all ears. And we would like it if we heard that. We'll gladly work with you. We want results, results. Here's my final message, and this one is to Democrats, Republicans, and independents. No more lousy trade deals that suck jobs out of this country. We can't afford them. Our communities can't lose the jobs. Our neighborhoods and our homes can't have more and more mothers and fathers that are thrown out of work. It's too hard on all of us, and it's too hard on the country. You see, honestly, America's confidence in our own ability to lift ourselves up by the virtue of hard work has been badly damaged by decades of defeat. And if you support more tr bad trade deals, you're not only failing to help us, but you're swinging the ax that hurts us. See, <laughs> last week's elections hurt, and I'd be lying if I said I, I didn't worry about the new attacks at state houses and in Washington that we're bound to see on working people. You see, I know how much harder anti-worker politicians have made life for so many working people since the first wave of hard right governors won office in 2010 in the U.S. House, in Wisconsin, 
in Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and elsewhere. But I gotta tell you, I'm not worried about the opponents who think our labor movement is done. You see, there have been many, many, many times when working people in our labor movement got hit hard and we hit the ground. Right here in Chicago in 1894, Eugene Debs led the National Railway Union boycott of any train pulling a Pullman car. And the strike brought rail traffic to a virtual standstill all across the country. Until the Army broke the strike and they put Debs in jail. People said labor was dead then. It's been said before and it'll be said again. In the 30s, American labor was on the ropes and thanks to the hard work and the courage and the genius of men and women whose names that you all know, our labor movement came roaring back and we rebuilt the American middle class. Yet those old heroes, as great as they were, weren't the reason why labor grew from the ashes of the Depression. We came back because the situation required us to organize. And because the voice of American workers was too strong, too strong to be silenced. When workers came together, all the power and money of the, the corporate trusts couldn't silence us. They couldn't make us go away. They couldn't render us irrelevant or declare us dead. See, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. The labor movement is so much bigger than a list of jobs and professions. We're greater than the sum of our members. See, we're the voice of all of those who get up in the morning and go to work. We're the people who clock in and clock out, who strive and struggle, who fight and scramble for just a little bit more so that we can earn a better life for ourselves and for our families. We're a movement led by the aspirations of working people. And I have no doubt, none at all, that America's working people today are every bit the equals of the working people in the 40s and the 30s, in the 1890s and the 1900s, and all those that came before us. See, look at the workers at Walmart standing together to make a difference. Look at fast food workers rising up for what's right. Look at the successes of traditional unionism. Workers are signing cards, brothers and sisters. Workers are winning first contracts. Unionism works. Solidarity works. And I can give you dozens and dozens of examples. And this month and beyond, you'll see more of it. As retail workers stand together around Black Friday and throughout the year for higher pay and schedules that really work. You see, working people, us, we're the power behind the American economy. We're the power in the work that we do on the job and in the food and the shelter and everything else that we provide ourselves and our families with the pay that we earn. Our movement has faced down challenges before and will do it again. 
And we'll keep trying until we find out what works. And then we'll use it. We'll use that what works to organize and then we'll organize some more and then we'll organize yet some more. See? We're reinventing our labor movement. Now as we speak, it's happening. We're reawakening the idea that workers have power. And when we start to win again, and I mean really win again, we're gonna see it grow like a wildfire because the need is there, sisters and brothers. The need is great. The want of workers is huge. People want to work for a better life. We do. That's the real American dream. See, it's the vision of a future that we share. Whatever your background, whatever you do, we're all one. Because this is America. This is our legacy. This is our fight. And we'll rise together and stand together and we will march together and by God we will win together for you and for me and for all of us and our kids and our grandkids and for the future that we can have, will have and must have together. That's how we're going to do it. See, over the past few four years, as Bob will tell you, I've been to Chicago quite a few times to talk about the future of labor. I spent time on those previous visits talking about specific changes that we've made at the AFL-CIO. We passed measures at our last convention, for instance, to upgrade and to strengthen our state and our local federations of labor. Because I believe that the labor movement grows from the bottom up, not the top down. And the stronger you are at the grassroots level, the stronger you are everywhere. We pass measures to open the doors to community allies and partners so that like-minded organizations could actually participate in the plannings and the workings of the American labor movement. Because we realized something, none of us, none of the progressive groups in this country are big enough to do it alone. But when we come together, we are such an overpowering force, and we represent nearly 90% of the values of the American people. See, those resolutions have put into action, and our organizations are growing stronger all over this country. This is kind of thing doesn't happen overnight. It's a process, and it's a process that we're committed to. And it's a process that needs every one of you to join into, to reach out to community friends and allies, those progressive groups, and bring them in, not as an afterthought, but at the beginning of the process. Because if we want them there on the landing, we have to have them there on the takeoff as well so that our issues are our issues, not yours or mine. At our last convention, we passed resolutions to strengthen ourselves and extend our actions past the electoral cycle so that we can be ready whenever we need to be to elect leaders and then to hold them accountable, to support workers who organize and to fight for and win the things that our communities need. Now, we may not like the results of the election, but let me tell you something. The work that we did this election season 
has made us stronger because we mobilized and we're still mobilizing. We're still here and we're here to stay. We're here for the duration because we've embraced social justice with new energy and with new vigor. We've made a stand for comprehensive immigration reform because it's the right thing to do, because it is the best thing to do, because it helps every American worker when we do it. And we want it to have a real pathway to citizenship for millions of aspiring Americans who live and work in this country today, people who are American in every way but on paper. And right now we're calling for an end to the deportations that are tearing families apart and damaging our communities. In the aftermath of the killing of a black teenager named Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, by a white police officer named Darrell Wilson, I spoke in St. Louis about the need for our labor movement to be a force for justice and for equality on the streets, <laughs> on the streets and in the lives of real people in our community. You see, as members of the labor movement, we don't come into existence when we clock in in the morning and cease to exist when we clock out at night. We're men and we're women, we're mothers and fathers, we're sons and we're daughters. And what happens to us in our homes and in our communities, as well as on the job, it matters. It really matters. And that's why the AFL-CIO has maintained a presence in St. Louis and in cities across the country to fight for social equality, to fight for access to our democracy, for investment in our cities and towns, mass transit and America's roads and bridges and highways, rail and waterways, and that's why we also fight against mass incarceration so that we can end the stigma that's happened to a whole generation of workers in this country. We fight so that they can have good jobs and job training for everyone, not just those at the very top. See, I like the theme of this year's event, public and private, organizing in solidarity. Like you, Eddie, I learned about solidarity from my dad. My dad was a miner all of his life. Yeah. In fact, he died from black lung disease. In fact, nearly every male in my family died from black lung disease. And he knew that every job in and around the mine mattered. That there was no job that didn't matter. And he knew that every life down there mattered. Every single life mattered. Now my father taught me, and he was right, that we depend on each other. We matter to each other. It's true in the mind and it's true in life, in a grocery store or in a public school, in a hospital or in a factory, we depend on each other. We're connected to each other through the work that we do and in our society and through our democracy. And I gotta tell you, America needs some real solidarity these days. Real solidarity. 
And I guess if you're going to boil down my views on the future of the American labor movement, I'd simply say it's solidarity, brothers and sisters. It's solidarity for every one of us. When people attack the pensions of a public employee and say they're too high, I don't have one, why should they? It's real easy to join into that chorus. But solidarity would tell you to stand with that brother and sister and help. and help those that don't have a pension get one, not take the pension from those that do have one. When a construction worker stands outside of a building because they've brought in non-union labor that they pay a pittance under prevailing wage, and you walk by that site, that's not solidarity. Standing with that brother and sister to help that job become fairly paid is solidarity. And when you stand by the water cooler or anything else and you hear somebody tell a racist joke and you drink your water and walk on off, now that's not solidarity. Standing up to end that prejudice and racism is solidarity. And that's what's called upon from us, the labor movement, because we have to live at a higher standard. Now too many people in this country have the sense that what's been tried doesn't work. But that's no reason for us to quit, because I can promise you this. Solidarity, real solidarity. Not lip service solidarity, but real solidarity works. And all you gotta do is see it one time. All you gotta do is feel it one time. And you'll know for the rest of your days that solidarity works, and it's the, our job to show the world that. Solidarity works. It's the rope that binds us. It's stronger than hate. It's stronger than fear. It's stronger than gold. Solidarity works, and as I said, I'm talking about real solidarity, the hard kind, where you need me, and I stand with you. And I stand with you when you're most afraid that you stand alone. And we stand together arm in arm, no matter the odds. And we welcome brothers and sisters into our ranks because our solidarity proves the strength of human connection. And because together we prove that working people can and must and will win a better day for you and for me and for all of us when we do it together, solidarity works, brothers and sisters. Real solidarity where your picket line is my picket line and mine is yours. And I don't ask what it's about. I honor it first. You see? That's what we're up for. We march together. We stand. everybody. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Great crowd, the biggest one we've ever had. So many younger faces, no ageism here, I mean it. 
Uh, before I say good night and we uh, sing Solidarity Forever, please stand in a moment. I want to recognize our servers, Boilermakers Union servers. They did a great job tonight. That is labor. That is work. Our servers, thank you again. You have the opportunity before you leave to look at the exhibits, buy books, buy t-shirts, contribute to the Illinois Labor History Society. We can swipe your credit card, but most importantly, go back, work to build your union if you have one and if you don't, participate in making that happen. So, thank you, Solidarity Forever, Michelle Gunderson, we'll see, lead us in song. Brothers and sisters, in our hands is placed a power greater than their hoarded gold. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. When the union's inspiration to the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? For the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Shops and this miles of railroad laid. Now we stand all cast and starving. This is the wonders we have made for the union makes us strong. So Untold billions that they never toil to earn, but without our brain and muscle, not a single wheel can turn. We can break their haughty power, build a new when we learn that the union makes us strong. So We can bring to birth a new world when the ashes of the old for the union makes us strong.